In something, in the 1990s, something happened that changed, kind of changed my perspective, and that's the 1990s for you younger folks just trying to think how old I am. Um, Vice President Dan Quell, he was the vice president. This is 19, I forget, 93, 94, whatever it was. He said something critical about a show, and the show was about a single mom. It was called, um, thank you, I had an old time moment. Murphy Brown, and it was a, uh, that season, it was about Murphy Brown and her decision to have a baby without a dad. Of course, there was a, a dad involved somewhere, <laughs> but she had decided to raise this kid without a father, and, you know, the show was about how wonderful that was. It was very affirming and positive. And da our vice president simply came out and said, you know, it's probably not that good. Kids need a father. And he was lambasted. He was a Neanderthal. He didn't know what he was talking about. Well, one year later, Barbara Whitehead, um, she was a sociologist and had been working on the importance of fathers, doing a study years, okay? Interviewed all kinds of people. And um, she published her findings, and the uh, title of the article was, Dan Quill was right. Now she published it, she published this uh, article, and it was all about why fathers are important, in the Atlantic Monthly. Now I want to ask you a question. How many of you have ever subscribed to the Atlantic Monthly? Exactly. <laughs> Three services, one person. Mr. Van Omering. I was shocked. <laughs> but anyway. Now I'm sure the Atlantic Monthly paid well, uh, you know, paid for this because they thought there was such a big controversy that here they were coming out with this, with the, with this uh, article, 37-page report on the fact that fathers are important, and hardly anybody, I mean, hardly anybody gets a magazine. There wasn't a whole lot of hubbub about it. I mean, we knew about it in the church, but it most people weren't um, um, making a lot of. It, it just was didn't seem important. They weren't, re they weren't reporting on it. And uh, even though this happened over 30 years ago, I still remember it because I remember thinking, it's, I remember thinking, people really don't care about truth. If any truth challenges what they've decided to believe, they're not going to accept it. In other words, truth apparently didn't matter to so many people living in our country. What they wanted to believe was true, that was important, and that was true. Take abortion, homosexuality, failure, the failure of entitlements, the resurrection of Jesus. I, ho I hope you had a, um, a chance to see that movie, The Case for Christ. I don't know how many of you did, but it was a good movie. God reveals to us that the family is not a culturally initiated structure. In other words, a family isn't just what society says it is. It's what God says it is. God is the originator. God ordained it to be a, a certain way. And we can't decide that it can be something different. It's a God-ordained important part of raising well-rounded men and women a father and a mother working together in a loving relationship. Now, Ma Malachi 4, 6, we're not going to turn there because I want you to turn there later. I want you to look at it later, dads. It says that if the hearts of fathers are not turned toward their children, a curse comes upon the nation. If fathers' hearts are not turned toward their children, a curse comes upon the nation. Read it for yourself later. So being a dad, a father, is an important job. So I want to start um, 
by reading two scriptures specifically directed at fathers. Ephesians 6. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Colossians 3.21. Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they may not lose heart. These two verses give us some insight in why kids and especially young adults rebel. And part of rebellion is self-destructive behavior. It amazes me how when a young person is filled with anger and rebellion, they do self-destructive things. You can try to help them, you can do whatever, but, but they're so broken. Unless they surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a young man right now that I have prayed with and even grew up in this church and I wish I could do something for him. He's living on the streets. When a father abandons his children, withholds love from them, criticizes his children regularly, treats their mom poorly, when dads don't spend time, don't discipline, when dads don't set a good example, children are going to become exasperated. They become angry. And little, you know, kids, they don't know how to deal with anger. I mean, they can't, oh, I'm angry here. Uh, they can't think it out. And so they stuff it. And they become rebellious, self-destructive. Now, I want to say, the message that I have, this is still the introduction. <laughs> this message I'm going to have for today is not to condemn anyone. Now, dads, if you leave here under condemnation, it's not from me, and it's not from the Holy Spirit. If you leave today, and in the midst of this message, if you feel condemnation is not from me, and it's not from the Holy Spirit. I argue with God about giving this message. Because, I, because it's a pretty narrow message delivered to fathers. Especially fathers with little kids. But this church has a calling for fathers with little kids. There's an anointing here to do it. We're going to have a baby dedication here soon, and you'll see what I'm saying. This place, Babyville. Oh, Foothills, yeah, that's the place to have all the babies. Today's message, this morning's message, is entitled Fathers. Four ways to rebellion-proof your kids. As a dad, you don't want your kids to rebel. You don't want them to become self-destructive. There is a truth, and, and that is when our children get a, a certain age, they're going to make decisions for themselves. But I believe that these four things that I'm going to share with you. If you're a father and you consistently try to do them your best, you're going to rebellion-proof your kids. Number one, be an example. Set standards. Dads, fathers, we lead our families by following Jesus' example. We lay our life down for our family. Sir, you should, young person, you should... Young man, you shouldn't get married unless you're willing to die to yourself. If you're getting married just so you can have sex now, <laughs> legally, it's the wrong reason. Of course, I was young once. I understand. I don't want to get into that, but you know, it's pretty... But somewhere along the line, you've got to think about, do, am I willing to lay my life down for this, for, for this girl? Am I willing to lay my life down for the kids we're going to have? And what am I really talking about? Uh, Matthew 20, 28 says that Jesus laid his life down. I'm talking about when the choice comes between your family 
and going fishing, TV, sports, golf, you name it, the family wins. Now, if you can't easily say, yes, of course, maybe you shouldn't have kids. When our children sense that they come first, when our children sense that they have won our hearts, that we always want the best for them, that we keep our promises, they trust us. And let me tell you, children want to trust you. It's not hard to get them to trust you. They already want to trust you. But unfortunately, you can also just destroy that trust. Here's a key to being a successful father. And you can write it down if you want. Here it is. When our children trust us, we can lead them. When our children trust us, we can lead them. When our children's dad know, excuse me, dads, when our, children's know, when our children know that we want the best for them, that we lay down our life for them, that we would die for them, they learn to trust us, and then we can lead them. Now, I hope that every father in here wants your children to embrace the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Each father in here wants his children to think biblically. Each father in here wants his, his child, son or daughter, to embrace biblical values. If you want that, you must live out your faith. We're not talking about being perfect, but your kids have to see you living what you say you believe. They have to see that you've chosen a certain path in your life. Sure, you're going to fail, but you ask for forgiveness and you move on. You admit it. I'm telling you right now, if you want a rebellious adolescent, say you believe one thing and do another. Say you trust in God and you believe in his principles, but then... You compromise those principles so that you can get more money or, or do what you think you need. That is a recipe for a rebellious teenager. Fathers, grandfathers, the best thing you can do for your kids or your, or your grandkids is to pursue God and to pursue God's will for your life. I made a lot of mistakes as a father. But I, th I, I know my children knew that I wanted to pursue God's will for my life. When your children, your grandchildren see your commitment to God, your honesty, your commitment to their mother, your willingness to acknowledge a wrong, ask for forgiveness, the willingness to forgive others, it makes an impact. If your faith is genuine, not perfect, if it's genuine, in your heart, you have committed your life to Jesus, your kids are going to see it. Proverbs 22, 6. How many times have you heard this verse? Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from, his, from it. Leave that up for a second. Let's look at that word train. Dads, fathers, who's training your kids? This is an important question. Who is training your children? And what are they teaching them? I think every Christian father needs to ask, who's teaching, who's training my kids? And what are they teaching them? If you've decided to put your kids in public school education, I wouldn't recommend it. My kids weren't going to be in public school. But I learned a long time ago, I'm not judge and jury. They're your children. You make that decision. But as your pastor, I want to challenge you with this. If you decided that public education is the way you're going to educate your kids, okay, then the question I have for you is what's your plan? What's your plan? What's your plan to counter the humanistic and relativistic teaching that they're going to get every day, every day, every day, every day, every day.
Now, I've seen some, I've seen some families do it and do it well. But I want you to know it's, it'll be difficult. But you've got to have a plan. How, dads, how we live our lives teaches more to our kids than all the children's church lessons, all the VBS that they go to, all the camps. I've always believed that if I failed in my faith in Jesus Christ, if I failed in my walk, I failed as a father. Gee, Dave, that's pretty rough on yourself. I'm just telling you the truth. I didn't want to wake up one day and see three kids that were going hither and thither, <laughs> hither and yon, whatever, and know that I failed. This may come a shock to many of you, but I am not perfect. <laughs> but I know this. Part of being a successful father is to create an appetite for godly things with your kids. And when your kids are little, especially your sons, they want to do what you do. I mean, they'll follow you anywhere. They want to do what you're doing. If the Lord Jesus Christ is the most important thing in your life, it's going to create an appetite in their heart as well. Hopefully my children will see me repent, seek forgiveness, and be willing to forgive others. Hopefully as a father, we all live in such a way that we have communicated that we keep our promises, that we, re that we respect authority, especially biblical authority. Biblical authority is the final authority. We don't lie, we don't cheat, we're loyal to our friends, we come to the aid of the less fortunate, we remember the Sabbath day. We tie, we tie 10%. We believe Matthew 6, is true. That if we seek God first, God's going to add all the things to our life. That Romans 10, 11 is true. Years down the road, we won't be disappointed if we do it God's way. And we believe Psalms 37, 4, that we delight in the Lord. He will give us the desires of our heart. Dads, you set the standard. You're an example. And mom, this relates to you too. I hope you can understand that. But today is Father's Day. It is not Hammer Day. It's Father's Day. I am not hammering. I'm challenging you. Especially those of you who've got little kids. Before I forget. A lot of what I'm going to say today, a lot of you fathers are just go, wow, that's, wow. Reeling from it all. I don't know, a year or two ago, um, I did a two-week series on eight suggestions of successful parents. I interviewed parents that were successful. One family had seven kids. All seven kids loved Jesus. Every one of these parents, all their kids grew up and loved Jesus. And through all those interviews, I preached a message, and also there's video to, to go along with it uh, as I interviewed these uh, parents. And if some of what I talked about, especially the discipline part, if that, if that kind of, you can buy this for $10. It's, it's a, a DVD. You can get it in the bookstore. And I hope you know for $10, no one's making any money. Certainly not me. Number two, the second thing we can do as fathers to rebellion proof our kids is discipline. Dad, you have to accept the biblical truth that your kids are sinful. Now, it shouldn't come as a revelation. <laughs> Humanists tell us that kids are born basically good. And if you give them the right environment, if they grow up in the right environment, they get the right education, they're going to make good choices. They're going to be good citizens. Oh, really? And so, our, our government, our education system that has a lot of influence in our government, what's always the answer? More education. Why do you think that is? Because they're just not educated. 
If they, had, if, they, if they were educated, they would make good decisions. So they pour more money into education, more money. It hasn't worked because no one's ever talked about the sin problem. And then they tell us as parents, what we need to do is simply build up their self-esteem. If we build up their self-esteem, if they really love themselves, like that's a problem, when they really love themselves, <laughs> then they're going to make good decisions. Give everybody a trophy. What? Don't even get me started. I thought it was good when my kids didn't get a trophy. It's a teaching time. You're not, always, you know, you're not going to always be first. I mean, this is how you handle disappointments. Jeremiah 17.9 says this. The heart is more deceitful than all else is desperately sick who can understand it. If that isn't counterculture, I don't know what is. Proverbs 22.15 Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Now, let's talk about foolishness. What are we talking about here? Are we talking about the silliness of children? Their absent-mindedness? No. We're talking about sin. Proverbs 22, 15 in the Living Bible says this. A youngster's heart is filled with rebellion, but punishment will drive it out of him. Ephesians 6, 4 tells us that we're to train, we, we just read it, to train our children with set boundaries. You, sh you should have set boundaries for, the, for, for your kids. And when they transgress those boundaries, they need to be disciplined. There must be consequences when they go outside of those boundaries. If you don't teach them diligently about consequences, they will never learn how to make choices. They'll make choices based on feelings, pressure from other people, what feels good, what they want. But they won't learn how to consider the consequences. In short, they'll have no self-control. I see all these young people rioting. Donald Trump, I, I, listen. The person they didn't want gets elected. They don't know how to handle this. So what do they do? They throw a tantrum. I wonder how many kids did that who loved the Lord Jesus Christ and were raised in Bilbo. I mean, I just, I'm just saying. I wanted my kids to fear God. I wanted my, I wrote a book on fearing the Lord, and when all said and done for me, fearing God is one of the most important theological concepts in the Old Testament. And what it is, is an understanding that if you disobey God, there's serious consequences. I wanted my kids to understand that. So I disciplined. Proverbs 13, 24. He withholds his rod, hates his son. He who loves him, disciplines him diligently. Go to the next one. If you refuse to di discipline your son, it proves you don't love him. For if you love him, you will be prompt to punish him. We're to follow biblical... We're, we're to follow biblical commands, so I spanked my kids. Oh, 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 no! Yes, I did. Okay. As a matter of fact, um, I was pulling up. Mark, do you remember when we were pulling up? Mark, you helped me put new cedar siding on the front of my house. Remember all those years ago? And we were pulling off the siding, and one piece, it pulled off, it was my hand, I went, Ooh, this is perfect. It fit my hand. Okay, that became the disciplinary thing. You shouldn't use your hands. I don't have time to go on that. But um, it became, and um, my kids hid it from me numerous times. Ha, ha, ha. 
they found very, very quickly that I could find another rod just as fast. Now, um, you should spank your kids. I, I, I. The, the Bible says, but here's, here's the deal. You can't do it when you're angry. If you find that you're spanking your kids when you're angry, you should stop. You should get some counsel and figure out how to do it without being angry. Because it's going to communicate the wrong thing. I mean, there were times when my kids did things, you know, Arrah! go to your room. They knew what was coming. But I had to, you know, when the anger was gone and I could go in the room and sit down and go, look, I love you, but I'm going to have to spank you. I mean, in other words, I was calm. We have a parenting class uh, twice a year, but it's, uh, they, they just had one, so it's not going to be from their five or six months. So there's that. I'm, I'm offering that thing for $10 today. I'm offering it. To the church is. And um, make use of it. I could say a lot more of this, but we're running out of time. Paul reminds us in Hebrews 12, 11 this, right here. All discipline, for the moment, seems not to be joyful, but sorrowful. <laughs> no, Dad, no, please. <laughs> Yet to those who have been trained by it, afterward it yields a peaceful fruit of righteousness. My son, stubborn little codger. I remember spanking, one of the things that you'll learn in the, the parenting class is Spanking gets rid of rebellion. And, and you, you need to discipline until the rebellion leaves. And you can see it. You can see it in their countenance, everything. I'm sorry. No, you can see it. Because when the, when the rebellion leaves, they hug you, and there's nothing but love in the room. You parents know what I'm talking about. But you've got, you got to have enough guts, dads, to get, to get to that place. The purpose of discipline is to promote growth so that your children make good decisions in the future. It's looking to the future. You know what? I've been doing this pastor gig for over 30 years. We'll just keep it at that. And uh, I don't think I've ever heard anyone who was disciplined properly by their father, look at it in negative terms. I'm not talking about abuse. I've seen family members laugh about it. Yeah, dad, ha, 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 you know, that type of thing. But when it's done properly, it produces good results like the, you know, whenever we follow what the Bible says, it's a good idea. If you're sitting there and you want to follow the modern psychologist's way of doing things. Okay, not me. And I got three kids who love Jesus Christ with all their heart. The third way to rebellion-proof your children, number three, is to communicate love and acceptance. Fathers, we do this three ways, very quickly, verbally, by hugging our children, and time. Our kids thrive on us telling them how much we love them, how much we love being their father, how great it is to be their dad, how proud we are of them. We love them. When my middle child, Mindy, was a little girl, I was telling her how much I love her, so proud of you. And then she looked up at me and said, why? It was an aha moment for me. You got, you know, you got to have meat on your affirmation, dads. I learned a lesson that day. Affirmation needs examples. You did a great job. I'm so proud you finished that. You really have talent. I'm proud of that decision you made. I'm so proud of you that, that you did what I asked. Those things have to be included. Dads, um, we have to learn to see the positive in our children. 
And if you pray, you'll, you'll see it. God will answer your prayer. And you praise those positive. You, you let your children know that you see that, and it's wonderful. You praise their strength. You praise their obedience. And this is so important because I guarantee you, they're hearing from the devil, their own minds, how they don't measure up every single day of their life. 1 Corinthians 8.1 tells us love builds up. We have got to see and affirm the positive in our kids. Pronounce success for their future. I can't tell you how many times when I put my kids to bed, I told them, God's going to use you. And here's the reason why. One of my children had a hard time hearing it. It just took time for it to sink in. He's going to use you. And don't forget the obvious. Children spell love time, T-I-M-E. They interviewed a bunch of, uh, there was this study I was looking at, and they interviewed a bunch of these elementary school kids, and this is what they said that um, they loved about their dads, okay? He takes time with me. Number one, he listens to me. He plays with me. He invites me to go places with him. He lets me help him. He treats mother well. He lets me say what I think. He's nice to my friends. <laughs> he only punishes me when I deserve it. He isn't afraid to admit when he's wrong. Did you notice the first five things on there were all about time? We can say, I love you, but if, you're never, if you don't spend time with your kids, I won't believe you. Dads, work is important. Being a success at work usually involves you being promoted and making more money for your family and providing for them. But if you're working, I'm just going to say this, if you're working more than 50 hours a week, you, you, you need to reassess what you're doing. 50 hours a week is a lot. Most of my life I've worked 50 hours a week. I'm not saying there's certain times that maybe uh, you have to work a little bit more because of situations, but you know what I'm talking about. Your family's got to come first. You're going to find out real, real quick that giving your kids gifts is fun and everything, but it doesn't, place, doesn't take the, the place of spending time with them. And the one thing, when you get older and, you're, and your kids are, you know, leaving the house. You are never going to regret any minute you spent with them. Do you understand what I'm saying? You will never regret any vacation you took with them. Anything like that. What you regret is you didn't spend more time with them. Number four, and then we'll get out of here. As fathers, we rebellion proof our kids when we pray for them. This is important to me. Because I figured out right away, and I loved my father, but my father was raised a, a certain way, very strict German and all that stuff. And he did his best. I love him, forgive him. There's a lot of things he did positively. As a matter of fact, I gave a message once on a Father's Day entitled what, what my father taught me. But there were some serious <laughs> holes in my ability to be a father. Ephesians 5 tells us that we are the leaders in the house. We are the spiritual leaders in our home. That means we're the chief shepherd. We're the chief intercessor for our family. We're the pastor of our home. We need to intercede for our wife and our children. Praying is not just for the wife. That's a spiritual thing. You, you take care of that. We are to pray for our wife and children in our morning devotions on our way to work, when we're at work, when we, when we come home, before we go to bed. I mean, intercession should just be a part of our life for our kids. 
A father who consistently prays for his children is a spiritual force that the enemy does not want to be released. Dad, you have to understand, you have spiritual authority. Release it. I don't know how much to tell you here. <laughs> I did a lot of things wrong. And I knew I was doing it wrong. You know, I, I asked for forgiveness and all that, but prayer really did cover, covered me. I made a decision early on that I'm, I may be making a lot of mistakes, but one mistake I was not going to make Because it was easy. I was going to pray for my kids. I also made a, a decision. I made a public de declaration in front of the enemy. You ain't having my kids. Period. Not now, not never, ever. And I started praying. You see, we can't be with our kids 24 hours a day. But we still have an ability, ability to affect every situation and circumstance they're in if we're praying. If we're praying, excuse me. I wasn't born in Appalachia. Oh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean that. In other words, we can have an influence even when we're not there. Prayer brings a cover of protection over our children. It brings conviction. It brings the fear of the Lord. I still pray every day that God's fear would come upon my kids that they would be afraid to do the wrong thing. That they would understand that sin always finds you out and there are consequences for disobeying God. I pray that almost in the same sentence as when I pray, God, fill them with your Holy Spirit. Prayer helps cover our mistakes. It fills the gaps when we really don't do very well. And if you're a father and if, and, and if you're honest, that describes you. <laughs> prayer releases a powerful godly influence on our children dads we all need help in this parenting thing let me have the worship team up here fathers again I want to say this if you leave today under any condemnation I'm not giving it to you it's not for me and it's not from the Holy Spirit if if you recognize today and, the, and you feel, boy, I was really a failure, well, turn that thing around. There's people in your life that you can share with and say, you know what? Let me share some of the things I did wrong. Don't do like I did. I mean, may, turn it around positive. I hope every father who has little children or grandchildren when you leave here today, I hope the prayer that is on your heart is, God, turn my heart more toward my children. Give me wisdom to be a father, a grandfather. Lord God, turn my children's heart toward God. Take that heart of stone and turn it into a, and make it into a heart of flesh so they can receive your Holy Spirit. Become real to my children. Lord, when my children are in VBS, when they go to camp, when they go to Future Quest, oh God, let your Holy Spirit pour it out upon them. I'm just going to tell you the truth. Every year, I lead prayer for, for Future Quest and have for 20 years. I don't know how long it's been. I have a prayer time in summer. Why, why have I been doing that? Selfish reason. I was praying for my kids. I would go from here, go into my office, get on my knees and pray. I prayed for your kids. Because you see, they're, they're, pray with us for, for future quests. Because when a young person, when God touches them, pours out his Holy Spirit on them, they can never deny what happened. And this kind of prayer, I know God answers it. Why do I know God answers prayers like I just am explaining here? 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says this. This is the confidence that we have before him. That if, we, that if excuse me, it's my, one of my memory verses, and if I, I have to read it, otherwise I'll go too fast. This is the confidence which we have before him, 
that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if he hears us in whatever we ask, we know we have the request which we have made of him. So I'll stand. Hallelujah. Let's give our dads another hand. Hallelujah.